Welcome to the AAUW members and friends, and welcome to the League of Women Voters members and friends. And to all of you who are here for the first time, we're so glad that you've joined us. Welcome to the 2022 Annual Legislative Forum, presented by the American Association of University Women and the League of Women Voters of Salt Lake. We have put together an exceptional pa panel for this evening of Utah Senate representatives and Utah House representatives. May I introduce you to Senator Daniel W. Thatcher, Republican, Senate District 12. Senator Thatcher represents Salt Lake and Tooele counties. Representative Karen Kwan, Democrat, District 34. Representative Kwan represents Salt Lake County, Murray, and Taylorsville. Representative James A. Dunnigan, Republican, House District 29. Representative Dunnigan represents Taylorsville. And There she is, Senator <laughs> Kathleen Ryby, Democrat, Senate District 8. Senator Ryby represents Salt Lake County, Ryby. Okay. Our moderator this evening is Robert Gerke of the Salt Lake Tribune. Mr. Gerke has spent 25 years primarily cover covering government and politics in Utah and the West, including seven years in Washington, DC. He is a graduate from the University of Utah. He began working for the Associated Press and in 1996 and moved to the Associated Press's Washington DC Bureau in 2001. He joined the Salt Lake Tribune in 2004 in DC before moving back to Utah in 2007. Mr. Gerke covered investigating the 2007 collapse of the Crandall Canyon coal mine and corruption in the Utah Attorney General's office from 2012 to 14. He became the Tribune's news columnist in 2017. He has two kids, three dogs, and spends his free time in the outdoors and rooting for the underdogs in football, baseball, and in life. Mr. Gerke. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donnie, and thank you, uh, everybody who's joining us. Um, she mentioned I have three dogs. Hopefully they don't disrupt the proceedings here tonight, but uh, I'm going to give uh, each of the representatives a little bit of time to introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about their priorities in the upcoming session. Uh, we're going to give two minutes each, and I guess we'll go by order of seniority. I think maybe we'll start with Representative Dunnigan, if that's okay. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and hello to my colleagues. So I'm Representative Jim Dunnigan. As was mentioned, I represent Taylorsville and Kearns. This session will be my 20th session in the, in the legislature. I served six years on the Taylorsville City Council. Before that, helped to get that city started from scratch and then moved on to the, the state. I'm looking forward to this session and um, anticipating that it would be more open than last session was when we were kind of uh, right at shut down or very limited, I shouldn't say shut down, but limited interaction because of COVID. But now with the way this new virus is mushrooming, I, I don't know what we'll be doing in two weeks from now. I serve on the political subdivisions committee and that's the committee that hears the issues between cities, counties and towns, and a lot of local government governance issues. I also serve on the Business Labor Committee, which addresses many of the business and labor issues. I, I chair the Political Subdivisions Committee, and I also chair the Legislative Process Committee. The legislative process is very important to me. I'm a process person. I believe in public input and trying to get a uh, good process that will generate good outcomes. I think this coming session will be uh, very interesting. We are running a budget surplus which is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing that we have money to do things with. It's a curse because oftentimes that raises expectations and people want money even be well beyond what is available. 
but I'm glad that we, I'm glad to be in Utah. I was born and raised in Utah and I, I love this state. And as I talk to fellow legislators from throughout the country, they are not all doing as well as Utah. You know, Utah is uh, really at the foremost and the forefront of our nation, both in unemployment and our economy. And uh, I love the way that we get things done. And I also love the way that we reach across the aisle and we work with our uh, fellow legislators on the other side. And I'll conclude with that. I believe I'm muted. Uh, Senator Thatcher, I believe you are next in our order of seniority, if you want to take a minute. Sure. First, Donnie, when you lift your sign, if you'd hold it up a little higher, like I saw you bring it up, but if I was speaking, I, I may not have noticed it, but thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, so I am uh, Senator Daniel Thatcher, and I was elected in 2010 uh, to an area that was mostly West Valley City and then uh, got redistricted into uh, largely Tooele and the West Bench, and then just got redistricted out of the West Bench and through Tooele and into Eagle Mountain. So um, that's that's good times. It'll be it'll be fun getting to know uh, such a new demographic. Um, but here's the reality: the reality is, I will never stop fighting for the people in West Valley. I will never stop fighting for the people in Magna, even if all of their population has been taken away from me. Um, I have this crazy idea that uh, human beings should matter more than donkeys and elephants, and that uh, that there's. I personally also believe that there's a greater aisle division between the House and the Senate than there is between the Republicans and the Democrats in the Senate. Um, I uh, I appreciate most of my colleagues very very much. Um, and, and some of the people that I am the closest to in the Senate are, are on the Democrat side of the aisle. Um, that said, we have, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate what Representative Dunnigan said about the challenges of a surplus, because the fact of the matter is this surplus was in large part from unsustainable sources. It's, it's things that will not persist. And so uh, to, to say we can suddenly budget all of these new uh, projects and programs, which is what I think a lot of people are expecting from us, it may or may not be sustainable. And uh, I don't think we do anyone a favor when we create programs or we create expectations that we can't maintain. Um, but at the end of the day, my priority and my focus will continue to be uh, to save lives, to diminish human suffering, and to make sure that the responsibility of the legislature is to solve problems uh, not to cause them. So that's that's all I got. All right. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Representative Kwan, I believe you could go next. Thank you very much, Robert. It's really good to see uh, all of my colleagues, and it's good to see all of uh, you online. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm Karen Kwan. I currently <laughs> uh, serve at District 34, but all of the numbers have been um, uh, or all the districts have been renumbered. So I believe I'll be District 31 um, if, uh, if all goes well <laughs> next uh, uh, campaign season. Um, and uh, I serve right now uh, in Taylorsville, West Valley, Murray, and Mill Creek. Um, uh, the new district will be Taylorsville and West Valley, uh, West Valley City uh, primarily. Um, I first was elected in uh, 2016 and served 2017. I'm currently the uh, minority whip and um, very, very happy to be the first, but hopefully not the only Chinese American to serve in the legislature. Um, and that's been very uh, important to me as my very first bill uh, ever that I ran uh, was to recognize Lunar New Year which by the way is February 1st <laughs> this year. Um, in my uh, day life, I'm a professor at Salt Lake Community College. So I work and live right here in, in the district. Um, overall, my priorities has been and will continue to be language access and equity uh, issues as well as uh, senior issues, education and um, uh, first responders, mental health uh, spe specifically. Um, and Senator Thatcher um, and I have worked on uh, quite a few um, issues together. He, of course, has done so much 
uh, for um, first responders in that regard. And so I thank him for that. Um, this year, we're really uh, looking uh, also at the disproportionate effects of COVID. We know that uh, our ethnic uh, communities, um, ethnic minority communities have been hit the hardest. And so we're going to be seeing some uh, disproportionate effects, not only in physical health, but in um, uh, mental health issues, as well as education, um, uh, economics. Um, and then overall, we're seeing um, issues. I mean, this is not unique to Utah, of course, but staffing issues. Um, and I'm looking at that impact to um, uh, the helping professions. Um, and right now, specifically, I'm working on a bill for um, long-term care facilities and staffing there. So, and, and I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Reedy, last but not least, you want to go next? Thank you, Robert. Um, my name is Kathleen Reedy. I uh, this is my 29th year in the state of Utah. Like uh, Robert Gerke, I am a lover out the outdoors. I came to Utah as a ski bum. And uh, while I was a ski bum, I was a truck driver and I was also a police dispatcher. And currently I am a school teacher. Uh, yesterday I was a third grade teacher. Today I was a kindergarten teacher. There was a special place in heaven for kindergarten teachers. I have to tell you that. It was exhausting. Um, I started out my political career in the State Office of Education. And um, then I moved over to the Senate, which I am completely honored to work with all these people that I see here today and all the people that I work with on the Capitol. Um, my priorities are education as a teacher and a mother. And um, I am working this year to bring some more nurses and decrease the ratio of nurses to students. I'm working on mental health, ex, uh, mental health and psychologists in our schools as well. As we've all noticed, there's some serious fallout from this COVID pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, a new thing I'm venturing into is food waste and trying to eliminate food waste from our landfills because it, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of money to fill up our landfills and a lot of methane gas is being released into the um, environment. So that's something that I'm touching upon now and that's new. Um, I work on ed appropriations, Senate Education Committee, higher ed appropriations, government ops, transportation, and um, that is the committees that I'm on. I am uh, I, excited to live in the state that has the greatest economy in the union. But as we talk about the greatest economy in the state, in the country, we also need to recognize that it has to trickle down into everybody's um, pocketbooks and everybody's households. Right now, our most vulnerable students and our most vulnerable families are not feeling like they are part of the greatest economy in the country. So uh, hopefully we can work on that with this great surplus we have. Thank you. <clears throat> Terrific, thank you. Um, so the first question we had teed up for you guys was a question on redistricting. Um, and I think we might have a unique group here because I think maybe all four <clears throat> voted against the congressional boundaries, if I'm not mistaken. But let's, uh, let's tackle redistricting. What was the logic behind the um, sort of disregarding the independent commissions maps, adopting the legislative maps? Uh, do you feel like the process was uh, fair and equitable? And we'll start with Senator Thatcher since he went second last time. Yeah, well, again, I, I, think, I think you're right that, that uh, everybody here actually voted against the congressional maps and yet it passed with, with a majority. So I'll just, I, I'll just tell you what, what I think their perspective was. Um, at the end of the day, let me tell you, I had conversations with some of the folks on the Independent Redistricting Committee about if, if they refuse to acknowledge the core of existing districts. Um, so for example, most of their uh, maps had me combined with Senator Maine. And how is that in the best interest of the people in West Valley and Magna for, for them to lose the representation that they have chosen for for decades now between the two of us. Um, and so in my personal opinion, I don't think that the maps should be drawn for incumbency, but I do think that you should preserve the core of existing districts. And that's actually one of the two uh, Supreme Court uh, 
cases where, where maps have been overturned. One is if you don't have equal proportion, if you have disproportionate numbers, uh, and two is if you uh, change the core and character of uh, existing districts. If, if, you, if you force two incumbents together and you can't justify in a court of law why you did it, those maps can be overturned. Um, so I think that the Independent Redistricting Commission could have received a much warmer welcome. Um, and I think that they could have actually been considered if they had not taken that hard, fast rule that no matter what, we will not consider the existing districts. We won't consider the core um, of, of who those people have chosen. Um, and so I think that that is why they weren't considered. As far as the congressional map, I do agree with the urban rural mix. I just don't agree with the way they did it. I think there should have been clean lines. I think you should have divided down, say things like I-15. That is a clear de delineating line that I can justify to my constituents. Why are you jiggering in through neighborhoods? Um, to me, that was the part where I, where I couldn't go. That was the part where, why I couldn't uh, vote for those maps. And I, I had those conversations with many of my colleagues but at the end of the day, the chairs were in charge and they were not interested in hearing my arguments. Okay. Uh, Representative Kwan, do you want to field that? And also, if you could sort of talk about uh, at the end of it, maybe what you'd like to see out of the independent commission going forward. Uh, do you think it is, needs to continue or should it be changed? Yeah, and there's a lot that I agree with uh, Senator Thatcher on that. Um, I specifically looked at neighborhoods and um, community groups and how they were impacted by the congressional maps. And uh, you can see that ethnic uh, minority neighborhoods were cut right down the middle. I mean, the uh, Salt, South Salt Lake and um, West Valley City, parts of Taylorsville, I mean, these are the um, areas both uh, West Valley City and, and South Salt Lake are majority minorities and they're cut right down the middle, or at least, you know, uh, they, they are cut. Um, so that uh, said to me that um, communities of interest were not uh, fully considered in the um, legislative maps. Um, as far as um, fairness goes and input uh, from the legislative uh, uh, maps, um, you know, it's hard in a very first year to kind of get this right all overall. Um, there were three maps of everything, right? And so which map uh, were we talking about moving forward? Now we, uh, in the House, um, uh, Democrats pushed forward or we um, moved uh, all three maps. We, we tried to substitute all three of the congressional maps forward. Um, but even then there was disagreement as to which of those maps uh, should go forward, which one shouldn't. So that really needs to be discussed uh, in uh, 10 years, right? Like, what does that mean to have three maps um, in, in, instead of having a uh, independent redistricting map? I think the process was, um, it was a good process. It was a good exercise in having um, perhaps a minority voice push uh, the legislature in, in past ways. I mean, I, I wasn't involved 10 years ago, but um, uh, I, I think it was a good way to hold uh, uh, us accountable, legislators accountable, and make sure that we had public input at a greater level than perhaps ever before. Um, I'd like to see that continue, and I'd like to see um, uh, more um, uh, effort on the uh, side, uh, on both the legislative side, but also in the independent redistricting, redistricting committee to work together and come up with, um, with a map um, uh, so that it, it, it was a it, more of a partnership rather than a competition. And that's what it felt like this year. Senator Reby, do you want to address the same question? Yeah. Um, so in the Senate, we definitely had a kind of a different process, I think, than they did in the House, and it was a little more um, fluid. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, there's 29 of us instead of 75, so that makes it a little bit less uh, contentious, I think. Um, in my district, I was pretty um, spread out, so my district did become a little bit more compact. 
But um, one of the things they were supposed to do is the preservation of a county. That's one of the tenants that we're supposed to follow. And Salt Lake County wasn't preserved. And it, we made a very strong effort not to preserve Salt Lake County. So that was upsetting. I think the uh, redistricting process and having these talking tours and meeting everybody actually did create a situation where it was really um, hard for our supermajority to be too aggressively um, punitive to some of our senators and House people. I, I do feel like that prevented us from being too outlandish. Um, uh, the one thing that we are supposed to uh, do is avoid pairing incumbents. And unfortunately, the most contentious map that we had was the school board. And uh, unfortunately, lately, our school board has been the most um, ground zero for every political conversation we're having right now. So we have two great candidates that have been paired, and now we're losing two um, incumbents in Salt Lake County. And so when we look at how we could manipulate something to actually affect the most local people, we've actually done that with this redistricting. Um, I did run a, a House map and a Senate map. I think redistricting was hard because we um, we didn't have the ability to pick one map. So the Independent Redistricting Committee, if they had brought us one map, we would have had an uh, easier time getting behind that. But we had three maps that had equally affected and disaffected a lot of different houses and Senate seats. So that made it difficult for us to work for. Unfortunately, this only happens 10 years. So we have 10 years to figure it out or not move the ball. So thank you. And Representative Dunnigan, to you. Thank you. So I agree with much of what has been said. I did vote against the congressional map. As far as the legislative maps, I agree with Representative Kwan and, and others. I, I think the independent commission could have been a better job, done a better job preserving communities. I, 10 years ago, I was not on the redistricting committee, but I was involved a little bit. And after they kind of came up with what they were proposed to do, I just went in and encourage them to clean up the lines in my area and follow the city boundaries and follow the, and we did. And so my, my existing district goes right down the city, city boundaries and I cleaned it up, didn't look to see what voters were there or not there, but I just followed the, the boundaries. When I looked at the independent commission, um, pr primarily at the house, I agree with Rep. Sam Kwan, I, uh, it was discouraging that they perhaps didn't really focus enough on the communities that needed to be kept together. I also agree with her that I would like to see more of a partnership uh, rather than a potential adversarial relationship between the legislature. The constitution says the legislature does the redistricting. And, but we can work with the independent redistricting commission and it's not easy to draw maps. I mean, people, it's easy to draw your own district. I can draw a wonderful district. But when I have to put that piece of that with the other 74 puzzle pieces of representatives in the state, it becomes difficult. Now in the house, we tried to preserve the borders of Salt Lake County. And I, I think we did quite, quite well. Uh, I think we did better than the, than the current map. My own district kind of looks like the state of Utah. It's got pretty straight, clean lines with a little notch at the top, right? So we call it the Utah district, I guess. And I, uh, you know, as, as everybody said, we have 10 years until we do this again, and uh, hopefully we can learn, learn from this. I was concerned with the congressional mass, particularly on the east bench of Salt Lake County, how it divided some of the communities into four different congressional districts. I mean, you have cities like Mill Creek and others, and they're divided up to four districts. I, I think, and I brought this up to my colleagues like Senator Thatcher did to his, and just suggested that we could adjust the line so that some of those communities are not divided up uh, quite so much, but that that did not, uh, not prevail. So I uh, is an interesting process and I agree with what's been said. It's challenging when the Inter independent commission gives you three maps and then that just, and there's some people that lot in the legislature that loves one of those maps and doesn't like the other one and it's really hard and it, it wasn't really and maybe they think well we'll give them a lot of choice we'll throw up a lot of stuff against the wall but that really doesn't help it would have helped to come and say this is our map and maybe we adjust it a little bit but that wasn't what they did thanks okay uh so our next question donnie i don't know if we can go to a minute and a half because i think we can cover this one a little faster but in terms of elections uh there's a, a ballot initiative that wants to 
dramatically overhaul the way we do elections, get rid of vote by mail, get rid of uh, prohibit ranked choice voting, only paper ballots. Do you support preserving vote by mail? And are you confident in the way our elections have been run uh, in, in, the, in recent years? We'll start with Representative Kwan, and if we can try to keep this to a minute and a half so we can get more questions in. Yeah, I can, I can answer that in a word, yes. Um, we should preserve it. I guess that was more than a word, <laughs> but I'll expand then. Um, vote, uh, vote by mail um, has uh, increased the number of people who've accessed uh, voting, who have voting, especially uh, when we're talking about um, uh, people with transportation issues. Um, uh, lack of transportation, um, some uh, English language issues. We do uh, allow for transportation, uh, sorry, translation uh, in, in the voting booth, but it, it, if it's difficult to get one person to the voting booth, it's difficult to get two people <laughs> to get to the voting booth. So um, we have seen um, voting access and voting um, uh, increase. Uh, if we move backwards, um, and we don't have a vote by mail, then um, we're going to see um, restrictions on, on our voting rights. Um, we know, at least in Salt Lake County, that uh, the process has been um, very, uh, very good. In fact, uh, we had a, um, a tour there, uh, let's see, today's Thursday, yesterday, uh, and, and invited all of our, all of our uh, colleagues in the house to uh, look at, in Salt Lake County to look at the uh, voting machines. Yeah, thank you. All right, Senator Eby, to you. Uh, I feel very confident in our process. I think we do an amazing job. I think that our vote by mail has actually um, created a, a very robust uh, representation of our community, not just people of color, but also our disabled. Our disabled and our elderly really struggle with trying to get out of the house and to the ballots. And if you recognize who really votes, it's our elderly. And um, I also think that vote by mail has been an extreme benefit because people actually can look up their candidates, they can understand the issues better, and they can really research what they want instead of walking into a room and saying like, I don't know, I'll just pick the person that's a female or an R or a D or I like that guy's name and, or they just don't vote at all because they don't know who those people are. So I think vote by mail has been a tremendous asset to our, um, our democratic process. And I really think that we should do everything we can to maintain moving forward in the direction we are and not go backwards. So uh, I'm supportive of vote by mail. Perfect. All right, Representative Dunnigan to you. Thank you. So this afternoon, I spent two hours with our county clerk, Sherry Swenson, and I guess I did have the, I had the tour that Representative Kwan had yesterday, kind of top to bottom on how our election system works with nine other legislators. And I have to say, it's, uh, fairly, it's pretty impressive on what they do in the safeguards and, and uh, the way they try to protect it from interference from the, from the internet or from ballot. Uh, duplicating every ballot's individually numbered. So it's not a matter of getting one and making photocopies. They each are individually numbered and many, many safeguards. And so I can't speak for the rest of the country because I think there may be some problems in, in other states. But I think in Utah, we've done a really good job. I will say I was a reluctant person to uh, go to vote by mail. I'm the person that likes to go in on election day and uh, cast that ballot and uh, get those hanging chads hanging. And so, but uh, I, I think vote by mail is here to stay. I know we have a proposal to do away with it. I think many people like it. I think there's been a real effort to try to safeguard it. And I, I'd be surprised if it goes away. I understand their concern, but you know, we passed a law this last session that the vital statistics bureaus got to notify the county clerks within 10 days if somebody passes away. So they got to get it up, get it off the rolls. So that's where I'll end. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually with you. I was not happy about going to vote by mail. I was concerned about it. Let's put it that way. But I've come to I've come to like it. So Senator Thatcher, uh, question to you. Yeah, I'll answer it as quick as I can. On a scale of one to 10, I'd say there's a less than zero percent chance that vote by mail goes away. Um, I chair the Government Operations Commission or Committee, which means that all of the election and voting bills go through me. And uh, my committee is 
really pretty squared away. They're pretty solid. They, they don't tend to be swayed by whatever craziness is on Facebook this week. Um, and they tend to have a pretty good understanding. We have a good relationship with the county clerks. We have a good relationship with the elections office. Our lieutenant governor has been absolutely stalwart um, on standing up and defending the election process. And so I, I know that there's a lot of consternation because there's a lot of noise, but I don't see them getting any support. I don't see them getting any traction. Okay, terrific. Uh, it is kind of an interesting situation where you have a governor now who was a lieutenant governor and a lieutenant governor before that uh, was the governor. Anyway, um, Senator Reby, um, we're going to try to keep this one to a minute and a half as well, if that's okay, Donnie. Uh, you, you all kind of talked about the budget surplus that we're going to be having coming into this year. Uh, there's There are efforts to get rid of the sales tax on food. Uh, the governor's proposed a grocery tax credit. The legislature, I think, is, is leaning toward an across-the-board income tax credit. Where would you like to see tax cuts come if they come? And if they don't, where would you like to see the money spent? What are your priorities for that budget surplus? So we have, um, it's always hard to figure out how we're going to spend a budget surplus that really doesn't have a lifespan. So it's always one-time money and trying to find places to put one-time money isn't always easy because most people want to have something that moves on through their lifetime or grows and becomes a program. Uh, I think that we really have some needs in infrastructure in our schools and in our communities. So I'd really like to see some of that surplus go to that. And along with Build Back Butter, better, I <laughs> Build Back Butter, Build Back Better, I think that we can actually move back to uh, some, of, some of these things that we actually are seeing as not being sound structural buildings and our schools and our roads and our hospitals and our community centers. Um, I am working on a, a unique kind of bill where I'm trying to create a state income tax credit for our highway patrol so that they have a sliding scale where we could give them a credit towards their taxes because we are losing our um, highway patrol people to our local agencies. And so there are some things that I think we can be creative with trying to use our tax credits in different spaces so that we can actually benefit some really specific people that are really not feeling the love that some of us do here in Utah. Uh, Representative Dunnigan, same question to you. So uh, we uh, Senator Vickers has a bill that sets aside, I think around 85, 86 million dollars for a an income tax lowering the state rate from 4.95 to 4.9. I, I support that. I, you know, we're running a healthy surplus. I think we can give some back to the people and let them decide how they're going to spend it. There's also discussion. There'll be a lot of discussion on what to do with the, the food tax and the governor's proposing to do a food tax credit, um, which is an interesting idea, although it seems kind of cumbersome to administer and may not get to the people that really need it just because of the hoops they have to jump through. I, I do think and agree that we need to put a significant amount of one-time money into infrastructure, whether it's uh, securing our water supplies and improving our air quality, improving transportation. Those are great spots for one-time money. I, I don't think we should put one-time money into ongoing projects. Right now, we're looking at about a billion dollars in one-time money and 200 million in ongoing. And, and I will say that's after a bunch of money has been taken off to, to try to treat as one-time that some people might think is ongoing. So there's, there's a lot of money there, but we're in the bubble from the federal rescue packages. And uh, I agree with what's been said by Senator Thatcher we should, and the others, we shouldn't treat that as ongoing. Uh, Representative Dunnigan, just a quick follow-up. You mentioned that you'd think that the grocery tax credit might be too cumbersome to administer. Would you eliminate just eliminating the grocery tax or would you like to see that continue? So the, you know, the Taxpayer Association put out a, a blurb on it that says, if we eliminate the grocery tax, you're gonna benefit the wealthy more. And we're talking about the sales tax and the state portion of it, because the locals portion, uh, nobody's talking about removing that that I'm aware of. So the, the higher income spend more on groceries. So if you just remove that, you're going to give them a, a bigger benefit. And it, it will benefit the lower income as well. But the, the bigger piece of that's going to go to the higher income. Okay. Senator Thatcher, do you want to address that same question? 
No, the, the, the entire question, not just the last part of it. Actually, actually, I, I kind of want to focus on the food text a little bit, if that's okay, because that, look, I, I don't know how many of you guys pay attention to stuff like this. I think most people don't. Um, but when that, when that tax bill passed, the tax bill did a lot of good things. But the one thing it did that, that I couldn't get past was it raised the food tax. It doubled the food tax. And I told them at the beginning of this process, look, if you raise the food tax, I'm out. I don't care what else the bill does. I don't care how much good it is. I, I don't care if you create this, this program. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the people who need the help the most are the ones who probably have the least amount of sophistication for navigating a government process, right? And so if they have to go through and, and work this system and work this scheme to be able to get a rebate on what they've paid on food tax, I think they're less likely to get it than, than, so ultimately what the argument comes down to is this, raising the food tax is good for the government because people buy food no matter what. When the economy is good, people buy lots of things and we have lots of sales tax coming in, right? When the economy is bad, they buy food. They buy food no matter what. So raising the food tax is great for the government because it's stable. My issue is I, I don't care. Like I, I appreciate the stability and I appreciate it's good for the government. And I appreciate that the government does other good, important things. But at the end of the day, if you've got a single mom with four kids, food could be 40% of her state of her family budget. So doubling that tax on her, in my opinion, is just not a moral thing to do. I can't do it. I can't go there. I can't support it. Now, the Taxpayer Association is right that wealthy people tend to buy fancier, more expensive food. But again, I don't, I don't care. Because if they're spending more, they're going to save more in taxes if we lower that taxes. I, I can't turn around and say, I'm not going to help this low-income family in Magna because it will disproportionately help someone on the East Bench Let's just help everybody. Let's help everybody. And, and so I don't think we will be successful in getting rid of the food tax because of the inconvenience to the government, but that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Okay. All right. Representative Kwan, uh, wrapping up with you. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what uh, Senator Thatcher talked about. Um, when we're talking about expensive, more expensive foods, we're not really talking about essential foods or foods that, um, you know, everybody kind of buys. Um, there is that disproportionate impact on our people who are in lower income, and it's going to mean more to them uh, to have that food uh, tax eliminated. Um, so I'm, I'm all for that. I know that uh, Rep. Lesser has... Um, uh, uh, she had a press release talking about her bill to eliminate it. I'm not sure where that's going to go, uh, but I'm I'm 100% uh, with her. It, we're in an interesting time where we're sort of flush with money, but we don't really have sustainable money, right? So it's here now. Uh, I think that we're going to see a whole lot of uh, uh, water bills. Uh, we just had the Great Salt Lake um, Conference. We'll be seeing some uh, ways uh, to try to uh, alleviate the, um, the drought there. We're going to see uh, transportation bills um, in terms of infrastructure. Some of the projects where um, construction costs have increased um, uh, tremendously. Um, uh, some of that money could and should go to those projects uh, that uh, have already been approved. Um, and I think that we uh, could and should see some uh, money go to climate change and addressing that and, and addressing air quality, wa water quality bills, and especially um, uh, uh, water quality uh, also in um, schools, um, getting rid of all those lead pipes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Representative Kwan. Um, I'll, I'll Venmo you for setting up my next question. Uh, I was going to try to combine several climate and environment issues. You mentioned the Great Salt Lake Forum that the speaker held the other day. Um, if you could just kind of touch on maybe two or three of you, what you think are the most important things that the legislature can do this session in terms of climate and the environment and air quality, uh, you know, in that in that realm. And we're, we're back to Representative Dunnigan to start with you. So the, uh, I'll start with the water. 
uh, I think, you know, we're well aware of the drought that we're in and uh, grateful for the snow the, and the rain we've gotten the last two, three weeks. It's been wonderful. And I don't think there's a easy fix to the, to the water. We have more people moving here, more people living here. Uh, we seem to be having a sustained periods of dry weather. So we have to be uh, wiser with the water that we have. We, we need to conserve and uh, sayings we have to be water wise and um, I'll be supportive of, of many of, there's a lot of ideas out there and many of them I'll be able to support that are trying to do away with practices that maybe make made sense in the past, but don't make sense today. Help people be more aware of the water they're using. I mean, we, we have to have water. That's a that's a pretty basic thing. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate the speaker pulling that together. And but it's going to take a lot of work, and that's not going to be solved uh, quickly. I'm always concerned about our air quality, and again, with more people um, moving here. And I think more fuel efficient vehicles, you know, the cars and automobiles we have today now, once they get up to operating temperature, they hardly pollute at all. And so we need to continue to promote a wise use of our traffic. I'd like to see some of the infrastructure money go into our already scheduled highway projects where people are stacked up and waiting and just idling their cars. And if we can move those vehicles along better, I think that helps our, our air quality as well. Great, thank you. Senator Thatcher, question, same question to you. Touch on a couple of the top environmental priorities for the upcoming session. Yeah, I, I actually really like what Representative Dunnigan said that many people don't think about. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to just say, we want clean air, we demand clean air. Well, oh, okay, what, what does that look like? Like, what, what do you do? You, you, like, we live in a bowl. So short of knocking out mountain ranges or putting giant fans to blow air up and, and, and out of the valley, you know, how do you, how do you mitigate that? And so I, th I think moving to tier three fuels is the single most important thing that we will do in probably ever uh, for, for cleaning up the air. I think tier three fuels is going to, uh, I really think that that's, that that is such a huge thing that I don't think people are paying attention to. Um, the challenge then is going to be, how do you get people to move to tier three vehicles? Um, not everybody can afford new cars. Not everybody is, is going to, and so, and so this is something that's going to take time uh, to really pay out and, and really pay off. Um, but the other thing that he hit on that I think is brilliant that most people don't think about is diminishing traffic congestion actually is a clean air uh, uh, life hack. Um, the longer you sit in traffic, the longer your car is running, the more you have to commute, the more you are polluting. And so focusing on telehealth, focusing on uh, telework, focusing on um, decreasing the amount that you have to travel and that you have to drive is great. But if we can couple that with an increased commitment to infrastructure, um, and, and making it easier for people to get where they're going in, in the shortest amount of time. Um, you know, I, I know people want us to just fix the air, but this is, this is a generational problem. It's going to take a generational fix and it's going to take, um, it's going to take a long time for, for, for people to shift their behaviors and, and, and their thoughts. I do think we're getting there. I think we have the cleanest air this year that we have had probably ever. Um, but we do still have to, we do still have work to do. We still have to keep, we, we, we still have to keep working on it. We have to stay committed, but, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay. Uh, Representative Kwan, before we go to you, um, can, we are going to be able to have, we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end for questions uh, from the audience. If you want to put those in there, I've kind of tried to touch on a couple of them already, uh, but feel free to put them in there. So Representative Kwan, if you could uh, address your top environmental priorities for the upcoming session. Yeah, I wanted to point out, thank you, Robert. I wanted to point out that um, something like 90% of our bills are like unanimous. I mean, we agree on a lot of stuff. And I think this is an area that that as, as um, we're all talking, um, I agree with a lot of what uh, has already been brought up. 
Um, I think that um, transit needs to be made easier, more efficient, um, so that people will use it more. I really like the idea of telecommuting um, as a lifestyle. We've seen that uh, work. We've seen it work well. Um, and uh, so the use of technology to, uh, to do our work and to, to live our lives, um, uh, to continue that and to see um, us updating um, outdated appliances, um, uh, you know, and, and things that use water like toilets, right, updating those and also looking at how we can um, incentivize energy efficiency in new development. And I know that there are bills already out there to, to do this. Okay, uh, Senator Reby, do you want to, do you want to Go next. Uh, you're, you're muted. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. It's going to take us a generation, but we don't have a generation and we need to start acting quicker and we need to start acting bolder and we all need to start to get involved. Um, there are a few things that they say that really tries to um, catalyze, you know, create a catalyst for more change quickly. And so our recycling company actually puts art on the sides of their recycling bins to make it in everybody's forefront in their mind. So we really need this to be on everybody's mind because we can't just keep waiting for people to jump on board. We really need to have it in the front of their minds at all the time. Uh, we need to have climate stable products. So during this pandemic, we recognize that we have a supply chain issue. So we did do some work to try to make that our food was more locally sourced so that we're not traveling so far with our food. And I think that's something that we can actually really get behind in the state of Utah to have some of our products made locally. Um, we need to consume less and waste less. So by wasting less, we actually could recycle our, you know, edible foods that aren't expired and donating them and putting them into something else besides our landfills, which actually put methane into the, into the air. So that's something that I'm running a bill about and I think would help us. Um, the last mile issue we have in government ops tried to create a situation where our housing is based around our transit hubs and that would actually prevent people from driving as much. So um, we have made some changes during this pandemic year and we actually have seen that we can make changes during this pandemic year or two years, I should say, but we should actually try to maximize on the benefits of what we've learned and actually try to stay in that lane instead of going back to the way we did things because we don't have a generation. Even though we are trying really hard, we have to keep it in the front of everybody's mind that this has to change quicker. Yeah, terrific. Um, our next uh, next question is going to be about, we've, we've seen gun violence, especially school gun violence, uh, perpetrated in schools across the country over the last year, year and a half. Um, we've, uh, we've not seen much appetite for any gun control measures in Utah uh, writ large. Uh, recently, we had a couple incidents where students were bringing guns to school or there were threats of violence that were stopped at the last minute. Senator Thatcher will probably want to plug his uh, 211. Uh, uh, but I think we'll, I think we'll, the question is, what do you intend to do to try to stem the threat of gun violence uh, going forward, uh, especially given the legislature's lack of an appetite for such measures in the past? And I think, are we to Representative Kwan, if I'm not mistaken? I, I or think we, so. Senator I don't remember. Representative Kwan, why don't you take it? Well, I'll get it. Well, I'll no, get it. Sorry, sorry, Senator Thatcher, if I just jumped in over you. Go ahead, go um, ahead. Uh, you know, I think somebody's going to have to remind me here and make sure that I, I recall this um, correctly. I think the House passed the bill, and it may have gone through the entire session, that said that we will no longer consider gun control bills. Um, I think that was a resolution that actually passed. No, I, I see Senator Thatcher saying, no, it didn't go through. I, I believe it went through the House. A passed few years passed ago. the House. The Senate said this is stupid and it never got a hearing. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. And thank you, Senate. Um, and, and that has been the, um, you know, sort of the, the uh, feel, the culture uh, in the House. Um, uh, uh, gun control type bills have not moved very far, very fast uh, in the House. Uh, so um, I, I have heard that there are some um, uh, thoughts 
about running some uh, bills, uh, such as um, Representative Briscoe's bill a few years ago that would restrict guns around schools. Um, so I have been hearing about that. I don't know of anything um, in particular, and perhaps uh, others know about it. Um, I was really appalled that a year ago today, um, we had uh, our congressional delegation hunkered down uh, in the in the Capitol buildings um, uh, and um, to experience firsthand what our school children go through. That is um, being fearful of um, gun violence, having drills, uh, gun, gun um, drills in their schools. This is something that our children go through yearly. Um, and uh, I was very um, upset that um, the uh, link between uh, what our congressional um, delegation had gone through was not, it went, it, there wasn't a click that said, our children should not be going through this, this fear, this violence. Um, I'm, I'm going to be continuing to work with our uh, congressional delegation uh, to um, uh, uh, push them to look in at um, how awful this is, how traumatic this is for our children. Okay. Senator Aby, you wanna go next? Uh, yeah, I'm a school teacher, I'm a mom, and it is unbelievably devastating um, to think about how these schools have become targets. Um, as a school teacher, I have had numerous conversations in numerous classrooms talking about, Ms. Reby, what would we do if someone came into our room right now? And we've actually made plans. And so we do do lockdown drills yearly, maybe uh, quarterly in our schools. But those are the drills. We have schools that are locked down maybe four times a year, literal lockdowns where we have people with gun violence outside of our schools. When I taught in Magna one year, we were getting the kids on the bus and the school's police officers call out and they put schools on lockdown as quickly as they can. We weren't on lockdown. And we actually had people with guns drawn while the kids were getting on the bus and all of us were dumbfounded. And so some of us, we were like, all right, everybody get them inside as quickly as you can. But this is not something that is like a idea or an, um, some untangible thing. This is literally happening in our schools every week. Every day, there's a school somewhere in the state that is on an actual lockdown because there's gun violence outside their schools. Um, I think this is a mental health crisis. And I think we can do some work to help people that are having problems in their lives or some kind of um, crisis and help them that way. But um, I would like to see what happened with um, the gun violence making people that own the guns more accountable. We're never going to change our gun. Well, we're not never, but it's gonna be hard to move that needle, but we actually can make people more accountable. If your gun is not secure and it's taken by somebody and entered into a school or used to perpetrate a heinous act against another person, I think that that person that owns the gun and didn't secure it properly should be held responsible. So um, it, as a teacher, as a mother, as a taxpayer, this is expensive. We went to a meeting with ATF after Columbine. It is a fortune. I mean, if you don't have compassion for these kids, the bottom line of how much money it costs to come in and provide all this counseling and help and all this other stuff, it's a fortune. We've spent a fortune securing our schools and the vestibules, but every person that's come into a school has been had access to that campus. So how do you secure a campus when the people that are actually doing the crimes actually have access to that campus. So it's very scary to me. It's very scary on every level. So um, I hope that we can start rethinking this because it's not, it's not helpful for our community. Thank you. Representative Dunnigan, question to you. Thank you. So I, I support responsible gun ownership. I think that people have a right to bear arms and, and a right to own guns. Uh, we also have a right and a responsibility to do that appropriately to teach our children to make sure the guns are safe and not accessible to those that should not have access to them. And it's not an easy solution. I mean, we can't just pass a law because we've already done it and said, don't take a gun to school illegally and don't harm someone. It's already against the law. So this is, as Senator Reby said, it's a 
mental health issue. In many cases, kids have stress, they have challenges, they're looking and there's a, a gun available to them. So we have a responsibility. If you're going to be a gun owner, you need to secure it. You need to take care of it. And you need to train your family members uh, that, that it's a deadly, deadly weapon. But I do believe that people have the right to, to own guns. I don't see that changing uh, in Utah. I, I do support and have supported a greater outreach and greater efforts. And I'll let Senator Thatcher talk more about 211. I do think we need to help these people, but it, it's horrible what goes on in the country. And I and I I feel for our teachers. My my daughter teaches at school and teaches at school. And probably three weeks ago, they had a lockdown. They had a shooting, and it, it's just. It's terrible, it's, uh, it's frightening. I think we need to work on it, but it's, it's gonna take more than just passing a law and saying, oh, you can't do this because we've already done that. So I could literally talk for an hour on this subject and still have more information to convey. I, I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I have literally been uh, invited to, to conferences and, and given presentations in Washington, D.C on this very topic. There, there are probably a, a handful of people in the nation uh, on state legislative levels that know this issue as well uh, or as deeply as I do. And I will tell you this, um, I'm going to give you some stuff that you probably don't know. The only commonality between every single school shooting, they're not all the same race, they're not all the same religion, they're not all bullied, they're not all loners. The one thing that every single school shooter has had in common Every single one since Columbine has been suicidal. Now, uh, the Safe UT app has worked miracles in the state of Utah. Um, we average about 350 interdictions per year uh, where we receive a tip and actually find a weapon or explosives or a planned school attack. 350 a year. Now, most of those do not make the news because we take care of them. We, we get the kids help, we, we, we solve the problem. And so that has been a tremendous benefit. You guys keep referencing 211. That's actually United Way. Um, I have been pushing for 988 for almost a decade. It launches this year. 988 will be the mental health equivalent of 911 nationwide. Um, if you stay focused on guns, you will never solve the problem because guns are inan inanimate objects. That is not the cause. That is not the root. Um, there has to be treatment. There has to be interdiction. There has to be uh, involvement. Again, this is something I could discuss for hours. Um, I am running a bill this year that will actually increase penalties um, against those who have been convicted of a felony and therefore have become a restricted person um, so I don't know if you guys remember the story of Buck Buck, but he had been convicted of a felony. He was a prohibited individual. He was not allowed by law to have guns. And yet when he was picked up and he had ammunition in his pocket, um, Sim Gill kicked him loose because he had ammunition, not a gun. Um, he then used that ammunition to shoot and kill a University of Utah football player. Um, so my bill uh, that I just got off the phone today with the NRA, and I think we will have their support, uh, will add uh, ammunition to the prohibition against having a firearm if you are a convicted felon, and will also add a one-year mandatory minimum uh, if you commit a violent felony with a firearm as a restricted person. Um, I think we will actually have support from the gun communities on that bill. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just go to the questions we have in the in the chat now, and if you have any others, uh, go ahead and ask those. The first one, I just it's a clarifying question, I guess, on some of the text discussion we had earlier, uh, and and I think rather than go around the whole room, I'm just going to ask Representative Dunnigan because you kind of touched on this issue before. Uh, this issue of giving a, a grocery tax rebate to people who are low income, maybe don't file taxes, maybe don't have a permanent address, maybe they're undocumented. How does that help those people? And, and can you explain the reason why a rebate might be preferable to just eliminating the tax entirely? Why a rebate would be preferable? I don't think it is. Well, <laughs> you, I, all the you, reasons you just stated. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's for people that are, are homeless or struggling to navigate, or, or even if they're not homeless, if you're just low income, 
and maybe even not low income. You don't have to be low income to challenge, have a challenge to get a rebate for food. And, and you know, the governor's proposed it, and I know it's well intended, but it's going to be difficult. I mean, I was part of a meeting recently where we tried to figure out how we could simplify the application for Medicaid and SNAP and things like, like that. It's already too complicated. So if you're going to do that, you're probably best to do it at the point of sale. That, that you know, that's what I think rather than have another process, although they're trying to get, get it down to the people who benefit from it the most to avoid the wealthy that you know, would benefit the most just by reducing the rate or eliminating it. But I think there'll be too many people that you'll, have, you'll need a whole army of people to go out and try to help people fill out the forms. I, I just, I, I don't think it works. Yeah. All right, and it, it, unless anybody else has anything to add to that, we'll go to the next one. Okay, great. Um, and I think we're with Senator Reby, if I'm not mistaken. So um, do, you inv do you foresee the legislature making any changes in the state's approach to COVID, uh, given the current Omicron surge? And what would you like to see if you were uh, in charge? Um, um, Omicron has been a challenge. Uh, I have, I'm a school teacher, as I say all the time, and uh, it's not something that I <laughs> shy away from, but it's such a big part of my life and it has been ground zero for Omicron. We are desperate for substitutes. We have halted literally almost everything going on in schools and we're just trying to mitigate the fact that we have kids and teachers and staff and bus drivers and kitchen staff not being able to come to work. Uh, we did reduce the amount of isolation due to the fact that the um, symptoms aren't as devastating, but it's. I wish we could go to this 2% that we put in the House Bill 209 or 249 that said if we had 2% of our students positive, we would do tests to stay. I haven't seen that happen yet. Um, I would like to see us be more aggressive. You know, it's something that's been lingering for two years. And uh, I understand that we want to keep our economy going, but we have restaurants that closed. We have businesses that closed. I mean, we have fallout from this illness that we have neglected to actually own. So I think we need to be more aggressive to try to stop this from spreading. We have <laughs> surpassed every high mark we had and we're still climbing. And so it's just been really hard for me to see this happen. And it's hard for me to watch kids lose their family members and come to school telling us that they lost an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad. It's, it's hard, it's been really hard. And these kids have lost, not lost, they've had interrupted lives and they just roll with the punches. But we're gonna be dealing with this for years. And so I think if we worked harder to um, truncate this experience, we would have been better off in the long run. So um, I wish it was just more aggressive. Mask mandates would definitely help us. Uh, I understand people don't wanna get vaccinated. I, I, I'm triple boosted right now. So, um, I, I just wish we were doing more. It's been really hard for our kids, our families, and our economy that's more susceptible to uh, instability than our stable economy drivers. Yeah. Representative Dunnigan, question to you. So I, I'm uh, concerned, distraught about the, spe the uh, spike in the virus. I, I wish more people would get vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. I'm boosted. It's not a guaranteed, um, but I'm hopeful that it helps. Very concerned about the numbers today. If I saw it right, it's like 9,000 people today. That's just back in June. I thought it was high when it was 400 a day. I mean, it was on the way down, but and now, and now look where we are. And so I'm very concerned. I think it's not sustainable for our hospitals, for our medical providers. They're short staffed, they're burned out even though the Omicron is not as serious, it's still serious and the vast numbers are just gonna generate more hospitalizations. So I'm, and I'm, I encourage people to get vaccinated, I, I do, and to wear masks as appropriate. I think we have some tools. I think we've been very fortunate that we have some tools, but we all need to use those tools. Do you, do you support any government intervention beyond what's in place now? I, uh, I support um, the current paradigm where we have the, the, the local health directors can come out with uh, at least a 30 day health plan. And then I hope that their local elected officials will, will uh, 
think carefully before they adjust that. I, I do like the process that we have set up today where each local health authority can come up with a proposal for their area or their county, and they can implement some of these things that are needed. Senator Thatcher, are you there? Or you want, should we go to Representative Kwan? Representative Kwan, why don't you go ahead and take the question? We'll come back to Senator Thatcher. I probably have a probably taking care say. of that cute baby. <laughs> I have a million things to say in a minute and a half. So I'll talk really, really fast. Um, I'm I'm really uh, upset that we haven't done something. Uh, we've, we've surpassed all of the uh, benchmarks, right? That uh, was in, I think it's uh, HB 294. Um, and uh, what we haven't talked about is long COVID. So it's not just that Omicron is, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, everybody's going to get it. And at least it's, you know, milder. Well, we still have Delta out there also. Um, but we don't know the uh, long-term impacts um, uh, with long COVID. We do know the trauma that uh, it impacts um, families who've uh, lost, uh, people who've lost uh, time in school, who've lost work. Um, and so I do think with it that we need to become more aggressive. Um, I agree that uh, we all need to get vaccinated because that will help. The science is amazing. Uh, how we could get our, uh, our, our scientists together and put together a vaccine, an effective vaccine uh, in an unprecedented amount of time. Um, and these tools need to be used. Uh, at, at, at a much more a aggressive level. And I, I do think that we need to change so that our local schools can have more autonomy in how they protect their kids. Thanks. Senator Thatcher, you, uh, you may have missed the question, but uh, talk about the, uh, given the current spike in COVID cases, do you anticipate the legislature will make any adjustments to the protocols in place to try to mitigate the spread? Uh, the easy answer is probably not. Okay. Well, the, there you the go. deeper answer is I think what's going to happen is um, I think our health departments are going to come in. I think they're going to make presentations. I think they're going to ask us to make adjustments. I think legislative leadership is going to push back a little bit, and I think that they'll kind of decide what they want to do. And and uh, I, I think very little is likely to change. I could be wrong. I, I love being wrong when I'm pessimistic. Um, but I, I don't think I am in this case. Can I go back around the room one more time? Because there is a bill uh, that's being sponsored that would prohibit businesses from requiring vaccine records, uh, places like the Bayou that require a vaccine record, concert venues, things like that. Would, just quickly, would you guys support uh, that legislation? We'll start with Senator Thatcher and kind of go to do um, So it depends on who's running it. I'll give you the, I'll give you the likelihood that it actually passes. Do, do you know who's, who's it's representative it? hawkins who almost died from covid but he wants to prohibit um so I'll, I'll tell you i i think it probably will run into trouble in the senate for this reason uh we don't like telling businesses what to do um and so i i don't see us turning around and saying you cannot set the right you you, you can't set the requirements for going onto your own property it's the same thing with masks um, we didn't prohibit mask mandates. We didn't say that you as a private property owner cannot set the rules for people entering your property or, or, or patronizing your store. And so I, I think it is unlikely that that, that passes. Okay. Representative Kwan, you want to take a quick swing at that? So I'm a no on that bill, <laughs> as is my prediction is it'll pass the House and get killed in the Senate. Okay. Senator Reby, quickly. I am a no to that bill as well. You know, Utah has been an at-will state for years and we are tying ourselves up in knots over this vaccination. And I, I just don't see it following the trend of what we've actually lauded as our basis of being great business friendly state. state. So I just, I'm a no, a hard no. Well, Representative Dunnigan. So Representative Hawkins is a, is a great representative. And as you said, he almost did not make it through COVID and he was hospitalized for months. But I, I think we, sh we should let businesses decide. As Senator Reby said, we are an at-will state and at-will state for businesses. And we let them make so many decisions and decide. And 
I feel for businesses that are trying to stay afloat in this pandemic and trying to keep their doors open and trying to make sure their employees and their customers are safe. And I, I think we should let them have latitude to, to decide what they want to do. Okay. Uh, Representative Kwan, we'll start this next question with you. It's a question from Nikki Nelson. Uh, referencing the Supreme Court currently deliberating on the abortion case. Uh, and and if, that, if they strike down Roe v. Wade, Utah has a law in the books that says it's Senator McKay's bill that passed, I believe, two years ago, that would prohibit abortion from the, uh, uh, I believe, the fetal heartbeat. Um, do you support do you support that proceeding if that if that uh, if the court strikes down that uh, uh, that Roe v. Wade and do you uh, think that the government should be able to force a woman to have a child? That's a a, a lot in one it's a lot. question. It's a it's a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of answers in one one question. Um, the the bill has already passed. Um, in order to stop the bill, we'd need to repeal the bill, right? And so that would require uh, another um, session. So if, it, it, depending on the timing, the bill may go into um, effect uh, before we could even get to a session. Um, I do uh, believe that um, there's going to be uh, restrictive um, uh, abortion bills coming forward this session. So given the climate, the political climate, I'm not sure that a, a, a um, repeal of that bill would work. I do know that there are states that have um, opened up their um, access uh, to, um, uh, to abortions for uh, women of other states uh, in the case that this happens. Do you wanna address, uh, sorry, Senator Reby, do you wanna address that? Same, same rambling question, but generally speaking, uh, if, if the Supreme Court repeals, uh, rescinds Roe v. Wade, do you support keeping the Utah law in place or repealing it? And what's the philosophical reasoning for that? I did not support that bill then, and I still do not support that bill. I believe in the sanctity of life. I, I really want any person to have a life that is fulfilling, comfortable, safe, pursuit of happiness and joy. But, you know, here in the state of Utah, we have some of the highest rates of abuse on children. We have some really high rates of domestic violence. We have few food insecurity. We have large rates of homelessness. And, you know, um, my grandmother-in-law, she actually um, killed herself by trying to abort a baby on her own during the depression. And I, I just find that this is a personal decision that a female, when handled having to deal with this situation, doesn't always have the tools to bring a person into this world. And so I, I can't put myself in every issue that somebody might be experiencing where they might feel the need not to have a child in their life. I understand that people think that we can give these children up for adoption, but you know, as a person who's had a baby, it takes a lot of time and energy and it, it changes your careers and it's very impactful on your life. And it's also devastating probably to have to hand over your child that you just carried. So I cannot begin to understand how complex this issue is for these parents and these families and these women and these teenagers, but to have an offense, to have an abortion be higher than it is to beat your wife to the point that they have a miscarriage or a partner, or then to abuse a child to the point that they die. I mean, we, we really need to look at what's going on in our community before we say that every person should be put back on this planet. Every person on this planet isn't taken care of. So when we start taking care of every planet person on this planet, every beating heart that's here, then I, I can actually try to change my opinions about the ones that aren't here yet. So I, I, it's a very hard decision. It, it, tears me apart inside, but I cannot support that bill and I do not support what's happening. Okay, Representative Dunnigan, to you. Oh, well, thank you. I, I think the issue before the Supreme Courts is really about states' rights. That, that, that's, that's what it is. It's not about banning abortion or allowing abortion. It's rather than the federal government making that decision, it's the state that should make that determination. And I support that. I think each state for themselves should decide how they're going to address abortion. It's really hard for me to opine on Senator McKay's bill if I don't have the whole thing in front of me. Okay, I know you, you, you said a piece of it, but I, I would want to read it and see just what it is. 
I think abortion uh, should be used in very limited circumstances and that we definitely need to give consideration to the life of the unborn baby. Um, I, I think it can be appropriate in certain circumstances, but I would like to see the states have the ability to, to determine what their state does in this realm. Sorry, I was muted. Senator Thatcher, uh, you want to take a swing at that one? Thank you. You know, I think the reason that abortion is such a divisive issue is because both sides can't see where the other side is coming from. And that is why I think everybody is, gets so emotional and so whipped up over abortion. The idea of forcing a woman to carry a child is so offensive to people who do not believe that a child is a child. If, if you believe that it is a cluster of cells, if you believe that it's not alive, if you believe it doesn't feel pain, that it, that it has no inherent rights, if you believe that it does not exist as a being, then any restriction on what you might do to it seems absolutely unfair and unjust and cruel. On the other hand, if you, like me, believe that that child is a child and that you have a moral obligation to protect and preserve and defend that child, then you cannot take lightly ending that life. Um, I just became a father. At, at 45 years old, I'm finally a dad. And I will tell you, that little baby is the best thing that has ever happened to me. And, um, you know, I have a little sister that was adopted. She was born at 25 weeks in 1982 when no child had ever lived at, at that late a gestation. Her mother was 15 years old, was on every drug known to man, and didn't even know she was pregnant. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that the government would be forcing a woman to have a child, I don't think that is a fair way to look at what's happening here. Um, what this bill does is it prohibits a woman from killing a child, from ending a, a life. And look, I voted against the bill that would have mandated object rape before an abortion can move forward because that was the government going too far, saying that you have to undergo a, a transvaginal ultrasound before you can terminate a pregnancy that otherwise can lawfully be terminated. That was simply cruel. And I opposed that bill. And I took a lot of hell from, from pro-life and conservative groups for doing it. But at the end of the day, if you believe that a child is a child, then you you cannot look the other way or, or diminish the value of that life. Okay. Uh, Donnie, tell me we need to wrap it up. I'm going to do one more quick one, lightning round. We've got a bunch of good questions in here, but this one's lightning round. Uh, given the cost of living, cost of housing in Utah, would you support an increase at the state minimum wage? And what do you think it should be set at? And I think, Senator Reby, I think we're starting with you, but I'm all messed up. But go ahead. Uh, I would support an increase of minimum wage with what's happening in our communities, but you know it comes at a price and it's hard to put that burden on smaller businesses, maybe larger businesses. Um, although I do talk about being a, at will state, I am a union member and I'm a strong union member and I believe that we need to provide living wages for everybody and make sure that they can actually live in the communities they work in. I was muted again. Representative Dunnigan, your turn. Thank you. So I, I do not support an increase in the minimum wage. I, I think it's unnecessary. I think wages are, are gone and are going up significantly. I can hardly talk to a client that's not willing to hire additional people at a much higher wage than they ever thought they would be a year and a half ago. Amazon starts at 15 bucks an hour plus a, a sign on bonus and many others do as well. So I actually think the economy is responding and uh, wages are going up without legislative action. Okay, Senator Thatcher. Uh, actually, I agree with Representative Dunnigan and, and I'll just put in a plug for what uh, Senator Reby said. Look, there are union jobs you could start tomorrow with no experience, 25 bucks an hour, get all your tools, get all of your training, get benefits from day one. There, there are jobs out there and, and right now, Unemployment is so low. Um, I, minimum wage jobs are supposed to be entry level. They're supposed to be for jobs that otherwise you can't really afford to get done. They're, they're supposed to be jobs for teenagers. They are not supposed to be jobs that you are, are building a household or supporting a family on. 
And so for, for those jobs, uh, they're starting wage. What, what's starting wage at, at, at Walmart now? It's like 14 bucks. Amazon is 15 and, and, uh, you know, go work union, make 25 starting wage with no experience and no degree. I'm going to, I'm going to get some contact info from you uh, afterwards because I'm <laughs> looking for a new career representative. It, it, it Kwan, pays better. It pays better than reporting, Robert. You know it does. Most things do. Representative Kwan, do you want to finish this up tonight, and then I'll get we'll go to Donnie for a wrap up. Thank you. I, I absolutely ditto what Senator Reby talked about, including the uh, uh, being a union member. I'm a, a proud union member as well. And in, unfortunately, uh, the minimum wage is not restricted only to um, uh, uh, teenagers. We see uh, families taking two, three jobs uh, in order to pay for um, uh, just to just to live. Um, we're living in a, in a gig economy now, um, and uh, I, I don't think, you know, $12 is enough in, in order to uh, sustain a family. So, um, and I don't know what, what the number is, um, uh, just because I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there is a number, but I don't know the number. Um, but uh, we do need to, as Senator Reby said, we do need to be mindful of the impact on two smaller uh, uh, businesses um, and how that'll impact. I do know that with our staffing issues today and, and the um, inability to hire and, and retain people in low wage jobs, it is uh, driving up the market um, as Representative Dunnigan says. So uh, hopefully we see uh, uh, minimum wage type jobs uh, increase. You know, I mean, I have a bill right now that talks about CNAs. Uh, CNAs are getting uh, somewhere uh, around, I mean, they could be getting $4 less than somebody at uh, 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 McDonald's. So we see uh, CNAs leaving the profession to work at fast food places. I mean, you know, that's, that, yeah. that, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for your time. Uh, Donnie, do you had some closing comments and, and then we'll let everybody go enjoy their evenings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Gerke, for your moderating. That was really excellent. And thank you, um, Senator Reby and Senator Thatcher, Representative Kwan and Representative Dunnigan. The main takeaway that I get from our annual forum this year is that just how hard each one of you is working and how hard you're working to support your constituents and how strongly you believe in what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for our members and our friends for joining us this evening for this special 2022 legislative forum. The 2022 legislative session opens in January and runs through February. Join us at the Capitol or online as the League of Women Voters of Utah observe each and every committee during the legislative session. The League of Women Voters of Salt Lake's general meeting for next month will be on misinformation and disinformation as a growing threat to democracy. And will be discussed by Professor Randy Dreyer from the University of Utah. To find more information about the general meeting or others, information about the League of Women Voters, please go to lwvut.org. And to learn more about the AAUW, please go to aau ut.aauw.net. Again, thank you all for taking the time and spending time with us to educate us. And thank you, friends, for coming. Be safe, be generous, and good.